So thanks very much, uh, everyone who's attending. Thank you very much to, to our very nice colleagues from the team of Project Rosie. And I'm very happy that in, in this webinar, uh, we're going to have uh, a very interactive and very nice session on responsible open science and everything that's belonging to that. And uh, for these, we have our, our colleagues, uh, Tom Lindemann, um, Kadri Sims and uh, Mathieu, so um, they, the three of them from the project Team Rosie will uh, lead this webinar. And so we're looking very much forward to their presentations and the discussions with them. So please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sebastian. Uh, hello and very warm welcome also from my side. Um, as Sebastian already said, I am Tom Lindemann working for the European Network of Research Ethics Committees. Jurek is a partner in the ROSI project and, and responsible for uh, organizing uh, stakeholder engagement events. Uh, so we are very happy to be here and have the opportunity to interact uh, with uh, members of and people connected to Eurodoc to discuss uh, some of the issues our project is addressing. I'm joined by my colleagues, Kadri Sim, professor uh, at the University of Tartu, leading a work package responsible for exploring uh, ethical issues in open science and Mathieu Rochambeau from the Austrian Agency for Research Integrity uh, that is leading a work package on guiding researchers, research teams, policymakers, et cetera, on how to implement open science in a responsible manner. I will very briefly contextualize the project before handing over to Kadri, but give me a second to share my screen. So very few, some information on the ROSI project. I hope you can see my screen. I assume this is the case. Um, so what is ROSI about? Or why ROSI? The challenge. Uh, is to identify novel ethical and legal issues, as well as new forms of misconduct and questionable research practices brought about by open science. So in essence, we are investigating to what extent open science and research ethics and research integrity are mutually reinforcing, um, and to what extent new challenges emerge, and we try to provide mitigation measures and solutions to address challenges to ensure open science ethics and integrity go hand in hand. More particularly, we analyze challenges in the context of existing ethical and legal frame frameworks to identify gaps and to fill these gaps. We pinpoint, so we pinpoint to gaps as well as to gray areas. And the ultimate aim is to integrate ethics and research integrity uh, as a structural component uh, of open science and uh, related to that, to that citizen science, because Rosie conceptualizes open and citizen science as being closely related, as both uh, aim to strengthen uh, societal involvement in research and the science society nexus. Um, the project essentially consists of four phases. First, the explore phase, which outline, uh, that provides a systematic inventory of the research ethics and integrity dimensions of open science and outlines social and legal challenges. Uh, this phase has not completely, but mostly been concluded by now. Um, it is accompanied by an engagement process that conducts stakeholder engagement activities to identify needs and facilitate the development of tailored solutions. The guide phase, that's a phase that is now ongoing and currently I would say very much the center of the project that carries out a policy assessment for promoting responsible open science, develops a complement to the European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity, as well as operational guidelines for responsible open science. In addition, also ongoing, finally, an equip phase that aims to improve the infrastructure for open science, in particular for responsible open science. Um, in this phase, we create a knowledge hub uh, and uh, education and teaching materials to upskill researchers and empower them to conduct open science responsibly. That's essentially already it from uh, my side. 
Um, and without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Kadri Sim uh, from the University of Tartu, currently based uh, in the United States, so very early in the morning at the US East Coast, who will uh, give an overview uh, of ethical and integrity challenges open science uh, creates before Mathieu subsequently uh, will address some potential pathways to uh, mitigate issues and fill gaps. Kadri, floor is yours. Yes, hello from my side as well. Um, good morning, good, good midday or, or something like that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Mm. Okay. Yes, so I'm I'm going to talk about uh, the um, ethical challenges mostly. Um, although the the work package um, that I've been leading is focusing also on the epistemic challenges, on the disciplinary challenges, but broadly they they kind of all fit quite well under the ethical challenges of open science as well. Um, I have here the long um, definition of open science. I'm not going to be reading it, um, but I think this picture on the left um, perhaps also quite well captures, um, you know, the main activities of open science. Um, it's about sci how science is done. Um, it's about sharing the data the sources, um, it's about being transparent, um, it's about building up and sharing new scientific infrastructures, um, it's about a broader engagement of science with, um, with the society and, and, a, and a broader communication with, with society uh, and also with whom science is done. So as uh, Tom already mentioned, um, citizen science is, is an important part of open science. And also, you know, broader collaboration within science as well, in turn, it, it, with the aim of, of, um, of, you know, tackling issues that are not going to be solvable within particular disciplines, for example. So, of course, the very general aim of open science is to improve science, um, make it more transparent, um, make it more inclusive, uh, more responsive to societal need, more efficient, more fair. And all these are clearly good objectives. Um, um, some of the best known components here, of course, are open access, for example, um, which I'm sure everyone is, has heard of and hopefully also practice, <laughs> um, which is, you know, there being no financial, legal or technical barriers uh, to accessing research results, and they should be accessible to everyone. Uh, and then we know that the publishing industry has accommodated this to some degree with the various gold and 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 green and diamond access models. Um, we know that um, um, ensuring open access to research is increasingly a, a standard requirement, also by funders, certainly for all EU funded projects. Um, and you know there there are good sides to this. Clearly, for example, there is data that says that open access articles um, tend to enjoy um, a citation advantage, for example. So it pays for researchers to, to use open publishing. Um, they are more often cited than non-open access articles. There are a few exceptions to some, some uh, disciplines, but, but generally that is the case. Um, oh, the idea of open data being that, you know, anyone, the data that should be shared, that anyone can access, use, reuse, share. Um, this is clearly relevant, very relevant um, for quantitative um, data that is easier to share and standardize. Um, mm -hmm, issues like um, another one, it's here, open uh, evaluation, for example, which tries to provide um, an alternative metric system to how science uh, impact is measured. Um, and also to open up the evaluation process, as you know, in many, many journals these days, um, peer review reports are public. Um, sometimes also uh, if, if the peer reviewer chooses um, with their names on it, again, in an effort to make um, the whole process more transparent. 
and of course, citizen science, uh, um, or although collaboration between scientists and non-scientists is something that has gone on for much more longer than we have this term citizen science. And of course, historically, all scientists were citizen science scientists in a sense that they were there were not that many professional scientists um, around. Um, but of course, the 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 quantity as well as quality of contemporary citizen science is something rather rather new. Um, the earlier um, the earlier examples of that might go back about hundred years when we think about um, ornithology research, for example and how uh, citizens' contributions to, as observers or data collections, collectors were used. And of course, um, we can go back to 1970s with the, uh, with the open um, the free software movement as well. Right, so this is, this is, these are just some examples. Um, since I don't have that much time, I'm going to move to this other <laughs> slide of mine, um, which, which goes into some of the challenges associated with. So the idea of citizen science or uh, open science is a good one, but what about what about the practical aspects and and what are the challenges that these these um, movements and uh, trends uh, in science governance, for example, have created? And um, here are some examples. So the idea of open access. Um, has brought along with it a, a real tsunami of predatory journals. It's not that predatory journals were not around before, but I think um, all of us in our in in uh, who are doing research are feeling the pressure and the uh, uh, and the difficulty often of 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 choosing between um, various journals and making sure that the journals that we publish are indeed doing their job are indeed doing proper peer review. Um, and of course, this this kind of activity has has gone beyond publishing as well into conferences and and so forth. Now, the open access um, another aspect of open access is of course that the publishing industry still seems to be making money out of it. <laughs> so it's not the readers who are seem to be paying mostly, but it's the uh, the authors who are now asked to pay um, sometimes very high article processing fees. Which might not be so problematic in the you know countries that are well off and that have a well functioning um, research grant system and and funding system, but certainly are can be very unfair to to um, uh, researchers from a lower middle income countries. Um, Matthew effect is something that is discussed increasingly in the context of open science more generally, not only open access, um, and this is a an old. Um, old biblical saying about the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer in the process, uh, meaning that it seems to be that, well, the worry is that um, those benefiting most from open science practices are those who are well off anyways. Um, so um, that means, again, uh, researchers in, um, in well-to-do um, organizations, institutions, and countries are going to be able to benefit from the availability of open data, um, from open access. Um, they will reap the benefits, whereas those who will who do not have the money to pay for the article processing fees, for example, um, or who will put out their data there for others to use, um, will be, the word is scooped in a sense that that others will use, use their data, analyze it quickly, and, and they have no resources to do it themselves as fast and as competitively. And worries have been expressed about um, open access actually creating mistrust towards science. So now that scientific results are more and more available, um, the assumption, well, uh, perhaps a naive one had been that, that um, you know, available research results are going to make it more transparent, um, and accessible to the public, um, what researchers are doing and what the results are. But of course, the reality of science is messy. Um, the results are complex. Uh, there's a lot of nuance. And um, perhaps the uh, effect is going to be the opposite. It's the confusion and suspicion rather than trust towards science. And I think we did experience some of that during the COVID um, pandemic uh, everywhere. 
Um, open data challenges, uh, just uh, some examples. Um, making data fair, which is um, equipping your data with the metadata so that others can easily access and reuse it, is, is costly in terms of, um, in terms of uh, time and resources. Again, who is able to do that? Um, there are several disciplinary challenges. Again, as I said, data sharing, it makes perfect sense in many of the quantitative fields. It's much more challenging in qualitative um, fields. Um, and uh, tensions with pragmatic concerns are there, as I said, you know, if, if researchers' careers are dependent upon gathering data and then uh, analyzing that data and, and coming up with novel um, results and publications, then there is a lot of pragmatic value in holding on to data. And if the, so, uh, so it might make perfect rational sense not to publish data uh, that you've gathered with your research group uh, because the career uh, advancement and the sort of academic pressures are there that hold you back. Um, proprietary and privacy concerns, of course, with open data are, have always been an issue. And the, and the problem of contextual integrity of data, which is that data often only makes sense within a particular context and how well open data systems are able to, to manage that context so that the meaning doesn't get lost is a question that's been asked. Citizen science. Um, some of the concerns that have been voiced. Um, the blurring of the research object subject boundary, this is something that is um, very much, uh, has been a cornerstone of research ethics, is that, um, is that the research subject is different from the research object. However, now with citizen scientists, a lot of people, you know, um, are being, are on the both sides of that boundary and that creates, might create issues. Um, there's lack of training and research ethics and methodology um, for citizen scientists. Um, and that might affect the sort of objectivity and, and quality of the data being, being um, collected or research being done. So because citizen science is often not done within research, established research institutions, and the question is, you know, because there is lack of usual oversight or regulation that applies to research, institutions um, there might be problems there ethical or otherwise mm, another worry that's been voiced is that um, many citizens um, do get involved in um, in citizen science because of they are motivated to do so because they have an interest because they're worried about something you know there's an, an environmental issue pollution um, they have some worries about other things they get it they get in touch uh, with researchers and they contribute to research um, but um, there might be an issue that the advocacy concern um, interest that they have um, affect uh, again the objectivity of the research um, in ways that this, I mean, this has of course been a worry for researchers, regular research, so to speak, as well. But there's been a more of an attempt to, um, to um, you know, be aware of that um, within the research institutions, and you know, when people go through their methodology training and 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 research ethics training, there is attention paid to that. Um, yeah, and the more usual worries about data quality, about inclusivity, who is who gets to be involved in, uh, in citizen science projects, um, as well as worries of exploitation or instrumentalization of citizen scientists in scientific projects. For example, mm, mm, when their efforts, um, you know, pe when people help with research to in, in substantial degrees, then, um, then uh, but don't get um, acknowledgement or, or compensation uh, for for the for their time or resources when 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 their effort has been quite great then this worry has been raised that whether uh, researchers aren't exploiting uh, citizen scientists in in for example data collection collection or otherwise so this is just a um, a little peek into the various challenges that the literature has outlined in terms of uh, ethics of 
um, and ethical challenges of open science. Um, I will try to, I have one case and I apologize for a lot of text here, but perhaps we can um, take a moment and read this and then have a chance to discuss the challenges involved here. This is a quite a well-known case from environmental science. Collected by our Latvian colleagues from literature. Okay, I'm going to just go quickly to the second page. So this is the source, um, and this is the question uh, that can be asked about this situation, right? So it's uh, it's it's data that is um, contested and politicized, and certainly that's clearly not the only kind of environmental data. Is not the only kind of data that to the, that this can happen to. Um, um, is it legitimate argument not to share raw data? Um, and why might scientists have reservations about sharing their data? Now, I don't know if, let me see if I can see people's faces as well. Is there anyone who'd like to comment on that case? Yes, Sebastian, I see your hand. You see my hand, then I might yeah. as well comment, yes. So um, yeah. I think uh, that's something on, on one hand side probably relates quite strongly to this uh, hyper competition that we see in science, right? Um, having the, the feeling not, mm -hmm. not just to contribute to the knowledge generation, but um, having a feeling that somebody else will use your data, your outputs, whatever you produce, and you don't get the benefit of it. That's, uh, the, that's something that, um, in my opinion, refers quite strongly to these kind of competitions but also is something that then to me does not constitute science. I mean, science after all is production of knowledge in a way that it's reproducible, that it's um, verifiable, that it's reliable. And all these kind of things don't really hold true if you're just publishing statements without making the, the actual source, the actual um, data that, uh, that you uh, use to draw these statements available. Then it's in my opinion, not actually to be considered science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Indeed, um, this this is one of the the motivations behind open science, right? That you you make your data available so that others can can replicate and can can look into it. So um, these worries that, um, but people, as as you see, have quite pragmatic worries, right? It's uh, data doesn't just come into being on its own, right? It's a lot of work um, to collect data. Yes, Joanna. Yeah, I I agree with Sebastian's statement, but I would like to use just that would like to point out that we are humans, um, the scientists. <laughs> I'm saying he here, um, so we we will always be um, you know guided by our emotions as well. And I can also see why you wouldn't want your data misused to try and prove something that isn't true. Of course, I I, I agree. It should be made available. I think it just inspires distrust to not make your data available so i think it's the opposite effect of what they want to achieve um but i can also see where they're coming from and just like you said i am now also currently making my data available and fair it takes a lot of work especially 25 years worth of data i think you would need funding just for making that uh, accessible to others indeed indeed yeah so so uh, Sebastian, is your hand still up or uh, from the last time or you want to add something? 
Oh no, that's there was actually okay. an, an old hand. Okay, old hand. Thanks. Yeah. So, so just to uh, finish up uh, from my side. Um, so these challenges that we've identified are really um, quite complex. Clearly, so it's not that it's not something that one scientist can decide to to solve in 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 some sense. Although there, I think there are certainly things that each of us can do. But there are more of a structural issues there, right? It's it's how research is organized, how people's careers uh, follow, uh, you know, what are the funding requirements, uh, things like that. So so the solutions, and we have we have produced a a framework, a normative framework for open science, um, where we try to identify important principles and values for open science, as well as outlining the challenges and providing recommendations for those challenges. And, and what the, really the key is, is that that um, these recommendations and this, the solving of those challenges has to happen on many different levels. So on the institutional level, on the funders level, on evaluators, on the, the, the research publishing world, um, you know, uh, researchers in well-off countries ha might have extra duties towards, towards our their, uh, researchers in lower middle income countries and so forth. Um, so um, open science has its challenges, but, um, um, and, and in some cases, I would say, you know, some goals of open science work against the other goals. So if, if, if making more science more efficient um, is the, or the the most important goal that you have, then that might be might be achieved in some other ways um, than than let's say the more democratic or public schools of open science that would focus on social engagement and reaching out. Um, um, so the idea that the that the um, open science is such a broad movement, um, and you know you could start. You could say that, well, let's just look at research ethics and let's just see how we can apply research ethics as such to open science. But I think our argument is that it's much broader. <laughs> open science is much broader and it has its sources of um, norms um, also in other areas, not only research um, ethics, but in the, in, in, in the broader discourses of like democratization and, and public engagement and so forth that are not strictly uh, strictly coming from research ethics. Okay, so that's uh, in order for me to leave enough time for others. Thank you for your uh, comments and for listening. Um, and I'll hand over now to Mathieu. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kadri, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Um, Yes, so I'm going to share my screen as well. Okay, I hope everybody can see uh, the presentation. Um, yes, yeah, so as already presented by uh, Tom and Sebastian, I'm Mathieu Rochambeau. I'm working at the Austrian Agency for Research Integrity. And within the uh, ROSI uh, project framework, uh, we are leading the guide phase, uh, which is basically uh, focusing on developing uh, policies, uh, documents, as well as guidelines uh, to implement and foster open science uh, in a responsible manner. Uh, so our work, uh, we're building mostly upon uh, our, our project partners' uh, findings in the project. So most, most of it from the work package one so, uh, led by Kadri and her team at the Tartu University, as well as the work package two uh, led by the University of Oslo. Um, yes, so just to give a, a quick overview of uh, the timeline of what we, are, uh, what we have produced, what we are currently producing and what we will produce uh, in the project. Um, we will, we have already pr um, com completed and uploaded one uh, work package, uh, one deliverable as a report on existing policies and guidelines uh, that was done in February last year in 2022. Uh, 
Uh, and we are currently working on the two uh, next policy document that we are developing. So one strategy policy paper on responsible open science in Europe, as well as one policy document complementing the European code of conduct that are due for June this year. Um, so the two documents that we are currently working on. And uh, we will produce as well at the end of the project uh, discipline related guidelines. Um, so this will be uh, our main focus uh, starting after uh, we are done with our two current uh, policy papers uh, over the summer. Um, so yes, the first document we produced was, uh, as I mentioned, the report on existing policies and guidelines. Um, we completed this uh, task, this report in February last year. Uh, and the main goal was to, produ to provide the project, but also the general public with a, a better overview of the existing uh, open science public policies across Europe. Uh, we chose um, to focus on the EU member states, as well as Norway and the United Kingdom as selected countries. And yes, the main uh, purpose of this report was to kind of be a, a sort of, of starting point from which we would develop uh, the policy document that we are now developing, as well as uh, discipline-related guidelines, and also to support our, our project partners uh, with potential uh, existing good practices, uh, good policies in place, or existing gaps. So to know where to, to focus on with our document, not to be redundant and redoing something that has already been done. Um, Yes, so the backbone of the doc of the report was um, the so-called country cards. Um, so these cards were basically um, one document per country uh, in which we gave an overview of the of the national open science public policies in place. Uh, so as you can see on the left side of the screen, uh, this was a basic, we selected um, existing policies. And just to see which country had what in place, uh, and and then we, as you can see on the right side of the screen, we selected a, um, a couple of of aspects that we consider as responsible uh, to assess the existing policies in place in the countries we we selected. Um, yeah, just to 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 assess what we consider as a responsible uh, policy regarding open science and where are the gaps? Uh, is there any any um, any common policies in place in, across Europe, or is every country having a, a different status regarding open science? And this is basically leading me to the to the findings that this report led to. Um, so as you can see, um, the takeaway information were basically. Uh, that's across Europe. This every country has a very different uh, status, uh, not status, um, yeah, situation regarding open science. Uh, although all countries are very supportive of open science in practice, in theory, um, the situation regarding existing policies in place is very uh, different across the continent. Um, yeah, also depending within country, obviously. Um, Yes, so this starting point then uh, led us to what we are working on right now. So the strategic policy paper on responsible open science. Um, uh, so this document is aiming at uh, supporting policymakers in implementing and fostering op responsible open science in Europe. Um, the document is structured in three parts. The first one uh, is an introduction, including definition and methodology. Uh, the second one is cross cutting issues and challenges uh, regarding the implementation of open science. And the third part, uh, a set of recommendation uh, to, um, to implement and foster open science in, in different countries and institutions. Um, yes, so just the ideas behind it are like the, the most structure of, of the recommendation and challenges were built on the open science taxonomy from the Foster project. Uh, so as you can see on the right parts, uh, we have uh, open access, open data, open reproducible research, open science evaluation, open science uh, policies, open science tools. 
to which we added the citizen science and open, open science trainings uh, based on the finding of, of our colleagues um, from the project, as well as the international uh, stakeholders that took part in the drafting process of, uh, of the document. Um, yeah, so on top of, of cooperating with our colleagues on this document, we also had the support of, of Tom and his team at Zurich, which included a, um, relevant international stakeholders who helped us in drafting the document as well as reviewing it uh, to, to have feedbacks and input from experts in the field who have more theoretical expertise uh, in, in open science in this topic. Um, yes, so this, this is basically uh, what we are focusing on at the moment. Um, I think uh, it would be now interesting and I would be very curious to, to hear more maybe about uh, your own experiences, um, uh, notably uh, if you, looking forward to thinking about the discipline related guideline that we're going to develop in the next uh, months. Um, what do you as researcher, as PhD student um, need or already have in your institution or in your own country? Do you have any support from your institution uh, regarding uh, open science, how to navigate through it? Uh, I think, Joanna, you mentioned that you're putting your findings in open access, and I would actually be quite curious to know uh, how you navigate through it. Do you have support from your institution or, or some guidelines in place? And is there any, would you maybe benefit from having uh, discipline-related guidelines? Um, yeah, so I can open the floor to, to any questions or comments. I can maybe start by answering your questions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks everybody for the presentations. Actually, uh, super interesting. I should say that uh, to start with. Um, and and to answer your question, Mathieu, um, I have no support other than my supervisors uh, supporting me in doing this. As in, they aren't angry, but I spend my time doing it. Um, so no, no guidelines. Um, nothing. Everything I learn myself on my conferences, um, or I ask my colleagues uh, for their practices. Um, so that's about it. Uh, so I would really benefit for, from some guidelines because I am now in my last year of my PhD. Um, but when I, I I had to learn everything on my own, uh, so guidelines would be very helpful, especially for new doctoral candidates. Okay, thank you very much for for the input. It's actually very very interesting for us uh, now that we're going to focus more on, on developing this guideline to also know uh, what are the needs or, or why, where people are actually standing uh, regarding this um, to, to produce something really relevant and that would be used mm -hmm. uh, i think one one other topic we could discuss as well um, would also be the because we are, aim, we are aiming at producing a discipline related guidelines, uh, but in fact, a lot of, of researchers also experience working on, on interdisciplinary subjects, uh, which might also be quite tricky when developing discipline related guidelines. So yeah, just also to, to drop this. Uh, yeah, Kadri, you have, you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say as well that what my experience has been um, uh, as an evaluator of research project is that in in a number of countries, you know, participation in open science activities, the way that you do your research and whether you, you know, you know, whether you share your data or how you publish, this is an this is an important part of evaluation of research projects. So, um, so I've seen this that that this is really something that uh, that the funders are uh, are pushing, but then again, you know, as Joanna said, if there's no guidelines or or help. Uh, then it's again. I mean, and, and and of course, in some institutions and in some countries, there is right. <laughs> so, um, so this again uh, contributes some in some sense to this unfairness. But we have lots of hands up, so I will. That's all for me. Yeah, thank you very much, Gallery. Um, yes, yeah, Sebastian. So um, maybe I can continue with uh, the, the same things that uh, Joanna said. So personally, for me, the experience was 
um, most of the things that, that I do, most of the practices that I took up actually were, um, um, yeah, I took up by, by myself. So searched the internet, searched other examples, other descriptions, and really then developed my, my own ways of, of doing things. Um, but I also see in, in my institution, this has uh, changed quite a lot. So there's increasingly a demand both from institutional uh, policies, as well as things that have now been put into national um, law or national policies uh, that we are required to practice open science. And there's also an increasing amount of um, both online resources, um, recorded lectures, um, in live support. So it's really, um, there's been a lot of capacity building in, in the last few years. And um, the, the largest action in this, um, uh, in this range really is starting just now where um, all the higher education um, institutions and um, related actors are actually um, this year starting with a, a huge project to, to put this on a, on a really um, sustainable base. So um, speaking for, for Slovenia, there's really a lot happening. Um, the impact is still, of course, um, slowly developing. So I have a lot of colleagues when, when I'm um, talking with them that, that do tell me that they have had some first lectures, but have a lot of open questions. Um, usually uh, their PI or the mentor is not able to properly help them because also they are, are lacking practices and experience. So there's a lot of things that are developing just now, but the base is quite quite promising and really nice. And then the, the last thing is with the efforts that go, go into this and the, the uh, discipline specific measures. So the efforts in my um, experience, um, once you, you really get to get into some habits and arrange your, your tools in a proper way, actually in the, in the very end, you can in some cases end up with less efforts being set up properly with, with all the exports and all the, the performance and everything. But uh, of course it takes uh, a lot of uh, getting used to getting the insights and setting yourself up in a, in a nice way. So in the very end, it can even time-wise pay off, um, but also a lot of such tools um, that are discipline specific then are missing specifically for, for me. There's a lot of analytical techniques that, that um, are based in, in some larger equipment and those all um, are based in um, proprietary software by the manufacturer. And so I have really some issues to get data properly exported, to get the proper metadata, to make this accessible and fair. And um, so in, in this regards, I think there's a lot to, to do. Uh, a lot of practices are, are there and are um, easy to, to transfer between disciplines, but like specific techniques and methods, I think that's that's really where, where the specific guidelines should um, try to, to um, get into and further, uh, further these parts. So many tiny aspects from my side. Yeah, thank you very much, Sebastian. It's really, really uh, interesting for us to, to have your, um, your comment as well. I think it's really relevant uh, for the situation. It also uh, fits uh, with uh, most of the comment or, or input we, we got so far. Um, yes, Dan, I think. I'll let the external guests uh, of the floor first. Uh, so I would suggest let's go on with a call and then Joanna, if time allows, I'll then share my point. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Then I will just briefly comment on on your first question. Uh, I think that we have, uh, from a Swedish perspective, have a growing awareness of of open access, and uh, and I think it's being introduced in more places in in doctoral training programs. I know, for example, my own faculty introduced a new implemented a new doctoral training program for all doctoral candidates starting this semester, which includes some basic training in open open science uh, topics. Uh, but I think the, the main uh, hurdle maybe for, for a doctoral perspective on this is the article processing charges, because if they're not covered, it's very hard to, to find money for that, financing for that in, the, in a doctoral position or in the, the research money that goes into a doctoral position. Uh, for us, we, we get all the, access, the ex article processing charges paid by the university library, but that uh, has been quite controversial within the university. Uh, so I think there is a big discussion, which we are surely aware of uh, re relating to that. Uh, just a short question also about the discipline related guidelines. I think this uh, is an interesting uh, division from as you're also surely aware, but uh, there is, uh, from my side, I come from a medical field. Most data are confidential because they are patient related. Uh, so that, there might be a division, as, as you described, outlined uh, between quantitative and qualitative, but also within the confidentiality levels of the data that you're working with. And I can imagine that being true for, for other fields as well. So uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Carl. Um, yes, exactly. I think this, um, this is one of the 
main reason or main relevance about this discipline related guidelines or like main challenge regarding open science in general um is this uh, also this uh, point that the eu is making uh, as open as possible as close as necessary um which is like how to navigate through how, how to make everything as open as possible but also to 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 stay in accordance with the gdpr and the existing existing legislation in place uh, regarding sensitive data um so this Yes, this is definitely one of the of the most challenging parts um, in the, in uh, com uh, implementing uh, open science. Um, yes, um, yeah. So, Joanna, please. Yeah, I just like to quickly uh, agree with Sebastian. Actually, um, so I didn't mention, but the attitudes are definitely changing. <laughs> so I can see it from the start of my PhD when I was suggesting some open science practices in my lab, and the response was generally, "But why?" Um, it's more work. Whereas now, at least, the response is like, oh, some somehow curious, some people supportive, and I think people are getting more and more aware of the advantages. But then even if they know the advantages, then they are getting blocked by this lack of training or lack of guidelines. Uh, so that's for sure a thing. And on the discipline-related guidelines, uh, I just wanted to comment, it would be great if they were discipline-related. I think it would be impossible to make it for all the fields. And for interdisciplinary research, I don't see why that would be a problem. So these are guidelines, right? I assume they are meant to make, help the researchers make an informed decision, but they don't have to stick to them 100%. So if you have an interdisciplinary research, you, you can look at different guidelines and just be informed to what is the best from each and, and just make your own decisions. Yeah, thank you very much. That's actually very, very good input and very good comment uh, for us. Um, yeah, because this also, yeah, uh, regarding the interdisciplinary aspects has been uh, very discussed uh, lately since we are slowly getting in uh, in the process of starting with, with these guidelines. So we are currently working a lot on the methodology and kind of scope of the document. So yeah, this is definitely good good input for us. Thank you very much. And yes, Tom, I think we have time for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I, I think it's it's very nice to hear, good to hear, also promising to hear that uh, awareness uh, about open science is growing, so that there might be a, a window of opportunity emerging or already existing um, to develop guidance uh, that will be useful. Um, one point why I think that guidelines are very important, or at least could potentially be very important, is to ensure a convergent, ideally homogenous, but let's be realistic, convergent practices. I think in the absence of guidance, when everyone essentially has to kind of find the pathway how to implement open science by herself, by himself. Uh, the problem is that these are potentially almost all well-meaning, well-intentioned people, but still uh, the research governance aspect here is essentially privatized. Um, and this should be something where communal guidance should, should exist. I mean, that's why the ethos of science, for example, has traditionally been very important because it guides the whole scientific um, community. And if no clear guidance exists uh, for researchers, there is a risk that despite many, many well-intentioned people, the result could be rather fragmented um, and picture thus could remain blurry unless some, some guidance is developed. Um, what I think also would be interesting, it's presumably not something we can discuss now, but I guess something we as a project, not only as uh, uh, Mathieu's uh, work package are interested in, are what are actually the biggest challenges researchers, often especially junior researchers, face so that we can focus our main um, guide and equip outputs on the most pressing challenges. Uh, that's why I also like to use this opportunity to again to invite you to attend uh, stakeholder engagement events of the ROSI project. Um, to stay informed, feel free to take a regular look at, at our website and follow us on, uh, on social media. I'll put the web link to the website in the chat where you also can find an overview of the outputs the project has already developed.
that's it from from my side at least with uh, respect to the presentation of of Mathieu can offer some concluding remarks in case there are no other issues to discuss yeah so thank you very much uh, on my side and yeah thank you Tom um so yeah unless there's any uh, further questions uh, I'm of course very available by email uh, if any one of you has as further comment or further question, I would be very happy to to uh, respond to them. Perhaps a, a, a few final remarks uh, from the project in general. So what you can expect from us during the mm -hmm. next year or so. Um, the project will, as Mathieu already said, develop some set of discipline related guidelines that hopefully will be uh, useful to uh, members of Eurodoc as well. Um, we will also develop some guidance for uh, policymakers. We are currently in the process, very advanced, developing training and educational materials. So you can expect them to, de to be disseminated fairly soon. And uh, we will develop a so-called knowledge hub where all results of uh, the ROSI project will be presented in a, in a user-friendly way. Um, some members of Eurodoc, including Sebastian, are uh, members of the stakeholder forum of the ROSI project. So uh, through that channel, we will um, make you aware of these uh, key outputs. And especially uh, regarding the knowledge hub, we will at some point in time, half a year from now or so, uh, look for pilot testers and invite external actors to pilot test uh, the knowledge hub to gather feedback on its usefulness so we will certainly invite members of eurodoc to contribute and share their perspectives here in case they're interested so we would very much look forward to uh, stay in touch to ensure that all our key outputs are aligned to the key stakeholder community you are representing so that's some final words from the rosy project uh but sebastian i guess the final words of course belong to you at eurodoc as the host of this Nice event. Thanks again from our side for inviting us to participate here.